I agree uh, with uh, Chris. Um, I guess I the way I would think of a crisis is as an irrational rationalizer of an irrational system. The irrationality of the system right now is fairly clear. You have masses of capital and masses of labor unemployed side by side in the midst of a world which is full of social need. How stupid is that? The rationalization that capital is looking for is, of course, to establish, uh, re-establish the basis for the extraction of surpluses, re-establish uh, the profit rate. Uh, the irrational way in which they're going about it is actually to suppress those possibilities by suppressing labor and suppressing, uh, if you like, the circulation of capital. So, I mean, that is what I mean by the irrational rationalizing of an irrational system. Uh, as a socialist, however, I think there's another way of rationalizing it, and that is, for me, the big question is how to take all of that capital equipment and all that labor and put it together so it actually meets human needs. That seems to me to be the rationalization we should be looking for right now, and we should be looking for at a moment of crisis, as a moment of opportunity, to think about the transition to socialism, communism, as one of the answers which we really should pre be pushing for. Now, in pushing for that, I think we need, if you like, to stir up some revolutionary fervor. And I, I love the revolutionary fervor that was last night uh, with uh, Alex and uh, uh, with Zizek. Uh, but it seemed to me that maybe there was a bit of a danger of revolutionary becoming an empty signifier. Uh, after all, we're, we're given revolutionary hairsprays, we're given revolutionary everything these days. And I'm certainly not thinking I want to be a revolutionary hairspray expert uh, or a revolutionary, you know. Um, Margaret Thatcher was a revolutionary too, so, you know, what would a revolutionary movement really have to look like? And to this, I think we need a theory of social change, which would talk about the ways in which a revolutionary movement could, in fact, move towards something which is a radically different kind of society. And to this end, I've become more and more intrigued by what I think, as I see it, is the theory of social change which is embedded in Marx's capital. And I wanted to use that and run it by you and see what you think about this as one of the ways to go. Uh, the passage uh, I always end up with is uh, a footnote, uh, about the fourth footnote in chapter 15, which is about machinery and large-scale industry, where Marx talks about the way in which technology uh, and relations to nature and social relations and uh, mental conceptions come together in a kind of dialectical configuration. And he connects it, if you like, also with his relationship with Darwin. And this looks to me like it's a sort of almost an evolutionary attempt to set out a theory of social change. And the elements Marx looks for, and I've added uh, an extra one or two in, in, into his formulation because I think you need to do that to complete it, is to say, let's look at the different elements and ask these different questions about the future, where we're at now, and how we might get from here to some other configuration. The first concept he sets out is the idea of the relation to nature. And he asks the question, what is the relation to nature? And how do we understand it? And in what ways would we think about modifying it in the future? And how do we think about the dialectical relationship between human activity and transformations of nature. Now, when we talk about this, obviously you can't say humanity determines nature or anything of that kind, and there is a co-evolution, if you like, of human transformations and also transformations in the natural order. And that dialectic is, is absolutely crucial throughout human history, and whenever Marx talks about it, he talks about it in a very expansive way. And I think it's something that we really need to think about very, very, very carefully. So this is, if you like, one moment in historical transformations. And if you ask the question, what kind of relation to nature would we be thinking about in a socialist society? And how would we actually get from the current relation to nature to that relation to nature which we were seeking under socialism? And that is, if you like, one of the questions. There is another question which Marx introduces, in which he says, we have to also took, look at the technological moment. Now, technology for Marx was not simply about hardware, it was also about divisions of labor, social forms, 
organizational forms, software, and all the rest of it. So there's a big, broad area here. What kind of technological mix are we looking for, and how can that technology be established? And the question he sets up, for instance, in that chapter on machinery and industry is, this question, how does capitalism actually identify its own unique technology which is absolutely suited to its own specific mode of production? Capitalism, after all, developed on the basis of feudal technologies. It developed on the basis of feudal forms of organization. And it's only when it defined its own technology in its own unique ways that it really truly defined itself as capitalism. So in effect, the evolution of technology is also connected to the evolution of a particular and the emergence of, if you like, a capitalist mode of production out of feudalism. So that, that, question, that question then becomes very important for us, which is, what are the technologies which we would imagine about a socialist society and how would they be established and how would we get from the fact that right now we can only use the technologies we have. How would we progress from capitalistic technologies to something which is other than capitalistic technologies? In other words, in exactly the same way that capitalism had to move from feudal technologies to its own definition of technologies, how do we move from capitalist technologies to, if you like, a whole definition of socialist technologies? Now that question is obviously not independent of the relation to nature. Because the relation to nature is technologically defined in exactly the same way, of course, that many technologies are being defined these days to deal with problems in relation to nature. All of these green technologies we're talking about are precisely about, well, there's a problem in the relation to nature. So we've got to have a tech so there's a dialectic, if you like, between the technological evolution that's going on and the evolution of the relation to nature. And you cannot keep them separate, yet at the same time they are distinct from each other. In other words, they're dialectically part of each other, but they are, if you like, independent of each other. Nature changes in its own way. We have to cope with that. Even as we see that the natural things that seem to be occurring are partly a consequence of what we do. I think it's no accident that some of the flus that have come out recently have been associated with high-density commercial farming. It was the taking of hog farming from North Carolina down into Mexico, and what happens? Swine flu comes out of Mexico. In the Pearl River Delta, the poultry industry is now even working with featherless chickens and things like that, all crowded together. And what do you get? You get avian flu. I mean, people, so these, these sorts of things, these dialectics are going on all of the time, and we're therefore having to think about those relations. So those are two moments, if you like, in this evolutionary process that we have to think about. The technological mix, we have to think also about the relation to nature. The third component that Marx talks about is social relations. What kind of social relations are we talking about in the present, and what kind of social relations will we be working towards? Now, clearly, the question of social relations is not independent of the questions of technology, nor is it independent of uh, the questions of the relation to nature. So the so but the social relations are a very, very complex area in itself, and there's a lot of conflict internally in terms of what kinds of social relations we're looking for. There are questions of class and gender and race and all those other sorts of questions. How are we going to deal with all of that? And the technologies also have a way of actually limiting the possibilities of certain kinds of social relations. For example, I, would, I, you know, I like the idea of having kind of horizontal social relations and lots of communal activity and social relations on that basis. But on the other hand, I'd hate to see an anarchist commune in charge of a nuclear power station. <laughs> and, and frankly, since we've got nuclear power stations around right now, it's all very well to say I don't want to have nuclear power, but you've got the damn things and they're going to be around for a very, very, very long time and you need a hierarchical structure of social relations with a very quick command and, and, and decision-making procedures unless you're going to have sorts of blow up. So the, in, in a sense, the technologies you get are, are, not, are not, if you like, independent of the social relations and the possibilities that exist in terms of social relations are not independent of the technologies. And actually, when you look at it, you kind of say, well, actually, people are kind of saying, isn't it nice that we have these decentralized technologies about solar power and wind power? The trouble is those technologies actually depend upon certain metals which have highly magnetic qualities. And those certain metals are called rare earth metals. And 95% of the current trade in rare earth metals is now actually coming out of China. And those rare earth metals are not easily got. So actually, you like to think it's a solution, but at the same time as you've got a solution over here, you've got a mess over here in terms of, for instance, the domination of China over the rare metals uh, trade and, and, and all the rest of it. So 
There's that, if you like. Now, the third, the, that's the third element. The fourth element in, in all of this is, of course, the organisation of production. Now, an audience, organ, uh, an audience like this, I have to, don't have to go into this. I mean, production can be organised in all sorts of ways. There is a labour process, and we have to think about the labour process, how it works. And again, it's not independent of the social relations or the technologies, the relation to nature. So you've got the production moment. You've then got something which Marx sort of talks about, which is, I think, really very, very important, which is the notion of mental conceptions of the world. The mental conceptions of the world have to change. We have to understand ourselves differently in relationship to both the nat you know, nature and all the rest of it, and those changes and transformations in mental conceptions are absolutely fundamental. But again, they're not independent of all of the other moments. And then there is the question, which you can in, to, uh, insert in here, is what's daily life about? The whole kind of realm of, of, of reproduction, uh, the making of, you know, making of your breakfast and, and living your daily life on the street and going to your, to your job, raising kids, all those kinds of things. What's, what's the daily life realm going to be like? And then there is finally the whole kind of m moment, if you like, of institutional uh, and administrative arrangements by which people actually get together. Now, this gives you, if you like, seven moments which have to co-evolve in any major transition which goes on in any kind of so, uh, social order. And if you go back and you reconstruct in Marx's Capital how he thinks about the transition from feudalism to capitalism, all of those moments had to change. Every single one of them had to. But they had to change in relationship to each other. And actually, it would be entirely false to say that Marx actually thought that any one of them was determinate. No, no one of them is determinate. This changes, that changes, this change here has an impact there. It's a co-evolutionary kind of process. It's a bit like an ecological system that co-evolves in a very, very distinctive way. And that, so that the transition from, from, from feudalism involved transformations in mental conceptions, transformations in, in, in labor processes, in technologies, in relation to nature, all of them co-evolved. But capitalism in itself once it, it was established, was not satisfied with the particular way in which those seven moments hung together. In fact, it's gone through perpetual revolutions. And I would ask you to think for a moment. Think about those four, those, those seven things and say, what were they like in this country in 1970? Think about it. You know, what were the mental conceptions that dominated then? What were the technologies that... And, and think of it now. In other words, we've gone through what the 1970s did was to begin a revolution in how all of those elements were going to co-evolve. So capitalism has been about the history of radical reconfigurations of all of those moments over time. So there's a process of social change operating there. And a moment of crisis is a reconfiguration of all of those moments. Right now, we are in a moment of crisis. And we've got to think about all of those moments. What are the possibilities in this particular moment of taking all of those elements and, and starting to reconfigure all of them in a different way so that we actually reorient society away from re-establishing the basis for profit making to re-establishing a basis for meeting human needs and it meeting them in a very, very radically different way. So this to me seems to me part of what we should be really thinking about. Now, the great thing about this, the great thing about this idea is this. Where do you start your social movement? Where do you start? Do you start at this moment or that moment? My answer is you can start at any one of those moments where you like, any one of them. But the greatest thing you have to do is not stay at that moment, you have to move. You have to create a movement that is a movement across all of those dialectical interrelations. And the great thing about this is it also says that capitalism doesn't know exactly what reconfiguration it's going to come up with. And at this particular moment, we are in a situation where we need, if you like, to get a better sense of how those possibilities might exist right now. But to do that, we need the resources, we need the imagination, we need the, the configuration, we need the scientists to help us, we need loads and loads of people to help us. We need the resources to get at this. We need to mobilize those uh, resources. In this moment of crisis, one of the biggest problems we have is those potential resources are, in fact, all, if you like, imprisoned. They're imprisoned ideologically, they're imprisoned within kind of institutional structures, and they have to be broken free. I work in a university system. One of the best things we could do right now is liberate the universities from their neoliberal and corporatist chains and actually mobilize. <laughs> and get all those people who don't know what's going on to actually start working on all of this. I mean, just imagine if we could do that. 
And actually, to the degree that none of this stuff is being taught or thought about inside of the university system, it's become totally redundant in relationships with contemporary crisis. And we have to make it much more, if you like, central. And it's not only universities I'm talking about. I'm talking about also all of the many other institutions which exist, which I think right now are sitting there kind of saying, what the hell is going on? We have no idea. We didn't do anything about, you know, so we've got to mobilize those resources. And that seems to me to be one of the things we, we, that really needs to be done. But in order to mobilize those resources, there has to be a vision out there, a vision that says there is an exit from this which is other than the one they're looking at. And we have to think about that vision in this very broad way. In other words, if there is going to be a transition from capitalism to socialism, it's going to have to take as long and as be as complex as was the transition from feudalism to capitalism. But when we look at that, it's not a matter of going on the barricades and somehow establishing a new government or something like that. We really have to think through a whole bunch of things like institutional structures and all the rest of it. We can take over existing institutional structures. Yes, we could take over the state, but we've got to completely reconfigure the state if we take it over. It doesn't make sense to me, for example, to say, let's uh, bust the state, let's, let's trash the state, let's get rid of the state. And then you kind of say, well, what kind of institutional structures are you going to put in there in, there in, in, in its place? And you're going to have something like, it's like a state, it's going to have to be organized that way. And that means uh, that all of those institutional arrangements have to be kind of re reconfigured. So these are the mi missions, it seems to me, that we have to uh, have right now. And to me, one of the big crises that exists right now is that we on the left have not actually advanced an imagination that can capture this moment of real dire consi uh, conditions in the world. we have not capturing it by saying, here is the task, here is what we have to do, and we can do it. If we really put ourselves together and we can mobilize the resources, this is somewhere where we can really go, but we've got to have this much broader vision, it seems to me, than is generally articulated in left thinking. Thanks very much. You know, um, having, uh, how many minutes do I have to answer all of these questions? Um, let me tell uh, a little bit, uh, in one of the groups uh, that I work with in New York City is called the Right to the City uh, group. Uh, it's an alliance of about uh, 15 organizations in the city uh, which have uh, interests. Uh, one of the key is Picture the Homeless. It's the organization of the homeless population. Uh, there's an anti-gentrification movement. There's a gay and lesbian youth uh, movement. There's an anti-criminalization movement. And they all want to put it together in a way in which they want to take back the right to the city and in a sense, one of the things they're talking about is the city as a commons. So it's not about losing the commons, it's about trying to regain the city as a commons. Now this I regard as a, a very important political movement. And I don't know quite exactly how to situate it against some of the conceptions of class which I, I hear. But I treat it as a class movement, and I see it as a class movement. And it uh, has a lot of potentiality. There's now an alliance between New York, uh, Miami, uh, suburbs of Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and other, other cities. In other words, we're trying to build a little bit of a national movement of a certain kind. And the difficulty, however, is this, that there are many issues that need to be addressed. The sort of issue that struck me so violently that I got really outraged was that in January 2008, two million people in the United States had lost their homes. And in that month, Wall Street gave itself bonuses of $32 billion, which is only 2% less than the year before. And they gave themselves that bonuses for crashing the world's financial system. I think this is absolutely outrageous. I see that also as a class <laughs> event. Now, now, I see it that way, but I've just been reading a whole bunch of inquiries talking to the people who've lost their homes and asking them who do they blame. You know who they blame? Themselves. This, there's no capacity to see the systemic nature of what it was that led into this. We have a huge educational task here. 
the mental conceptions of the world with which people are approaching these questions are absolutely erroneous. And this is the sort of thing that I'm interested in when I start to talk about you know, all of those different moments and how they have to hang together. There has to be a real assault at that ideological level. At the same time as, yes, indeed, the internet is, for instance, is a great way but on the other hand, it can be used all sorts of ways. It's like the telephone, yeah. I mean, can you use it for revolutionary purposes or counter-revolutionary purposes? I mean, I, it, it's, just, it's a great tool and, and we can use it. And, 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 I, and I like that side of it, but you know. Uh, but also, yes, we start in a radically different situation now. And my point about talking about the feudalism, capitalism thing is not to say it's exactly the same, but that, yeah, but we have to think about those moments. And those moments don't necessarily change because of working class pressure. I mean, Francis Bacon radically transformed the conception of nature and radically transformed how a production system could be understood. And that radical transformation actually then led into a capacity to reorganize production as a science and a technology rather than as an art. In the 16th century, production was considered an art. By the 19th century, it becomes science and technology. In other words, these changes are going on all of the time and you cannot actually say there's only one moment which is changing things favorably in your direction. The bourgeoisie does things which actually open up possibilities. And, and those possibilities are things that we need to seize and recognize them. And we have to analyze them and understand them. Uh, there's, 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 there's a lot of work to be done here. And I think it's you know, very important that we start to think about how that work is being done here, how it's been done in Egypt, what's going on in Latin America, what our relationship is, is there. The social movements around the world right now, which are anti-capitalist, are innumerable. The biggest problem is how to somehow or other get that together with some unified conception that can really challenge capitalism worldwide. And it is going to have to be through alliances. It's going to have to be through understanding that the way this, these moments hang together in, say, southern Africa is not the same as it, it, is, it is here. And it's not the same here as it is in, in Zimbabwe. And yet, somehow or other, we have to think then of a, a, a dialectic way of bringing many of these elements together. My theoretical analysis, if you like, taking off from Marx, challenges some of this, the, what seem to me to be some of the interpretations of Marx. I don't like the base superstructure argument. I don't like the idea that ideas are determined materially. There's a dialectic, and actually when you read Marx, it can't be anything other than a dialectic. If Marx thought everything was determined by material circumstances, he wouldn't have written capital. Right? And, and he, wrote, he wrote capital because he didn't believe that. And capital had its effect. And we can do those kinds of things. And, and, you know, but on the other hand, it doesn't mean that just you write capital and then the world changes. No. Obviously, all the other moments have to change. And if they don't change, you get blocked. And I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that sometimes you push on one of those moments very hard and you get to a certain point and you don't go any further. And the reason is because the other moments are not changing. And you have to think about what's going on elsewhere and the new technologies and all those kinds of things that can, that can give you a, a new leverage. It's that sort of imagination that it seems to me has to go into the idea of a, of a movement to socialism. Otherwise, we will continue to do very nobly, which many people are talking about here, defending, defending where you're at. And it's very important to defend where you're at because that then is the basis for new movement. But defending where you're at is different, as it were, from saying, I'm not going to defend anymore, I'm going to go on attack. And this is a moment, and that's why the moment of crisis is important, because the crisis we're in right now is a moment of weakness. Weakness for ruling the ruling powers. And at a moment of weakness, you have more opportunity to go on attack. And I think that, yes, we defend, we defend, but we've also got to think about real lines of attack where you can actually shift the whole dynamic of this radical moment of transformation, because we're going to come out of this in one way or in another. And our task is to make sure we come out of it in the way we want to see, rather than simply uh, let the system decide that it's going to reestablish the basis. And as Chris kind of says, if it reestablishes the basis for extraction of surplus once again, all we're going to have is 
a, a brief period of respite, and then we'll be back in the same mess all over again. Because frankly, I don't think the system is sustainable. I don't have an apocalyptic view of it, but I don't see how you know three and a half percent or three percent growth indefinitely forever is possible. It's absolutely out, and if that, that's a condition of re-establishing capitalism, then it seems to me we are simply going to be in one crisis after another. So we'll either get something done this time or we've got to prepare ourselves very well for the next time.